Welcome or welcome back to my channel. Thank you for watching. Today's topic, we got God and healing. We're going to take a look at a few of these ancient gods of healing. How did they get these attributes? Divine messengers parting knowledge of medicine and healing. What's their significance today? Also, we got a crazy story from the Hebrew Bible. All that and more. Thank you for watching. Let's get into it. So first up, we have Hermes, a figure from Greek mythology, known as the messenger of the gods and the god of various domains, including commerce, travel, and communication. The caduceus is a symbol often associated with Hermes, but it's important to note that it's commonly confused with another similar symbol called the Rod of Asclepius, which is more closely related to healing gods. The caduceus is often portrayed as a short staff with two intertwined serpents and wings at the top. It's not primarily a symbol of healing, but is more related to heralds, messengers, and commerce. In modern times, the caduceus has been mistakenly used as a symbol for medicine and healthcare, likely due to its visual similarity to the rod of Asclepius. Asclepius is the son of Apollo. He became a renowned healer and physician known for his exceptional skills. His most famous attribute was the rod of Asclepius. This symbol represents healing and medicine and has become a universal emblem for the medical profession. His talents were so extraordinary that he could even bring back the dead to life. This act raised concerns among the gods, especially Hades, the god of the underworld, who worried that Asclepius might disrupt the balance between life and death. In response, Zeus struck Asclepius down with a lightning bolt, fearing his powers. Despite his demise, Asclepius' legacy endured and he became a revered figure in the world of medicine and healing. Temples and sanctuaries were dedicated to him where people sought his divine assistance in their quest for health and well-being. So Hermes isn't a healing god traditionally. I just wanted to show the caduceus. It's used in alchemy, astronomy, it's a representation of the planet Mercury in astrology. It's also prevalent today in the medical industry. And anytime we have a figure like this, whether it's a deity or a biblical figure, anytime they either have a staff or a rod, pay attention because they're portraying something a lot more significant than the figure just walking with a stick. It symbolizes like an intellect, a divine wisdom, or even a skill, some kind of power. Whether it's art, like paintings or statues, or whether it's literature. Understanding the symbology behind some of these stories, myths, legends, is hugely important to understanding what the message is, the message they're trying to portray. But for now, let's get back into healing gods with Don Von Terry from Hinduism. Lord Don Van Terry in Hinduism is revered as the god of medicine and healing. It is said that he emerged from the churning of the ocean of milk holding a pot of nectar called Amrita during an event called Samudra Manthan. He is revered as the father of Ayurveda, the ancient Indian system of medicine that focuses on holistic well-being. His teachings emphasize balance in body, mind, and spirit, and he is often depicted with symbols of healing, including the pot of nectar. People worship him on Donteras, seeking good health and prosperity. Don Venteri's legacy continues to influence traditional Indian health care, making him a vital figure in the realm of healing and wellness. Lord Don Venteri is still prevalent today. There are healing and medical institutions over in India that bear his name. He was a part of the epic where the gods and the demons joined forces to create the elixir of immortality. Now let's take it back 
to ancient Egypt with the goddess Sekhmet. In the land of ancient Egypt, there lived a goddess named Sekhmet. She was a striking figure, often depicted with the head of a lioness, a symbol of her ferocity and power. She had a dual nature, embodying both destruction and healing. When she was angered, she could unleash chaos and plagues upon the world. This made her a formidable protector of the pharaohs in times of war, as her fierce presence struck fear into their enemies. One day, Ra, the sun god, grew displeased with humanity's rebellion. He summoned Sekhmet to punish them. She obeyed her father's command and went on a rampage. Unleashing her destructive fury, the land was in turmoil and death seemed to be everywhere. Seeing the devastation, Ra realized that Sekhmet's wrath needed to be stopped. He devised a clever plan and had beer dyed to resemble blood. Sekhmet, thinking it was blood, drank it eagerly and became drunk. As she slept, her destructive rage subsided and she transformed into a benevolent goddess of healing. Her breath was believed to have healing properties and the Egyptians began to seek her for protection from illness. Her story serves as a reminder of the delicate balance between destruction and creation in the world. If you're watching this right now, thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it more than you know. If you would, please hit the like button, hit the sub button, help this channel grow. Leave me a comment down below. Drop me some knowledge. Let me know what you think. Let me know what type of content you like. Let me know what kind of subject you'd like to cover. What's your favorite stories from the ancient world or deities or whatever. Thank you so much. Now, let's move on to the Hebrew Bible. We got this crazy story with fiery serpents. They're seraphim. Nakash ha seraphim. Let's get into it. The book of Numbers, chapter 21. The Israelites were wandering in the desert after being freed from slavery in Egypt. They were growing impatient and discontent with their hardships, which this is out in the middle of the desert. They began to complain about the lack of food and water and expressed their frustration. They even regretted leaving Egypt. In response, God sent fiery serpents, often referred to as seraphim, among the people. These serpents bit the Israelites and many of them died as a result. The people then realized they made a huge mistake and approached Moses confessing their sins and asking him to intercede with God on their behalf. God instructed Moses to create a bronze serpent and place it on a pole. Anyone who had been bitten by a snake could look up at the bronze serpent and they would be healed. As instructed, Moses made the bronze serpent and those who looked at it were indeed healed and saved from the snake bites. The reason I think that these were more than just poisonous serpents is because they used the word seraphim, seraphim serpents. They bit people and many people died. Also, you have the miraculous healing with the bronze serpent on a pole. You look at it, you're healed, almost as you're healed by faith. Yahweh said, I just delivered you from slavery out of Egypt showed you all these miraculous things. You what? Want more food? Let me know what you think down in the comments. What's your theories? But wait, we still got more. This event here carries on tradition throughout the rest of the Bible, on and through the New Testament. 2 Kings chapter 18, this bronze serpent named Nahustan comes back up again. Hezekiah was a righteous king of Judah who removed idolatry and restored worship of the one true God. One of his notable actions was the destruction of the bronze serpent, Nehustan. This thing was still being worshipped as an idol, 
and it was given offerings and they were burning incense. This is more theological than it is about healing, but it's brought up again in the Gospels. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the human one be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him will have everlasting life. Lo, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the powers of the enemy, and nothing will harm you. That concludes this episode on God and healing. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you stay tuned for the bonus, and I'll catch you all on the next one. Welcome to the bonus. I got a crazy mystery for you. But first, you did hit the like button and the sub button, right? It really helps the channel grow and I appreciate it so much. Here is today's mystery. These photos are from November 22nd, 1963, Dallas, Texas, the assassination of one John F. Kennedy. This lady here, was nicknamed the Babushka Lady. She earned her nickname due to her appearance, as she was wearing a headscarf similar to those worn by Eastern European or Russian grandmothers, commonly referred to as Babushkas. The Babushka Lady was seen in various photographs and film footage captured during the Kennedy assassination. She was standing in close proximity to the motorcade and was seen filming or photographing the events with a movie camera. However, unlike many other witnesses, she never came forward to provide her footage or share her testimony with investigators. The mystery surrounding the Babushka lady has led to numerous conspiracy theories and speculations about her identity and her potential involvement in the assassination Despite extensive efforts by researchers and authorities, her true identity and the content of her footage, if it still exists, remain unknown. The Babushka lady's presence at such a pivotal moment in history has made her an enduring enigma and a subject of intrigue into the study of the Kennedy assassination. That was the bonus. Thank you for watching. Leave your comments down below. Tell me what your theories are on the Babushka Lady. I think it's so fascinating. And hey, thanks again for your time. <laughs>